So I told Richard my plan was to come in here with a black turtleneck and give you the full uh, Apple style <laughs> overview. And he said, no, if you're gonna try for the Steve Jobs, you've gotta cut your hair. Uh, so we went for uh, Mad Men instead. Norman is a rare sight. And I've received nothing but abuse for it. <laughs> Here at CMU, we value substance over style, it turns out. So I'm Norman Beer. Uh, I wear a few hats here, as you've heard. I'm the director of the Open Learning Initiative, the executive director of the Simon Initiative. And what I'm kicking off is an emphasis on tools that are going to be, or are, I should say now, part of the toolkit, but that you can pick up and use right now. Um, we'd like to walk through these from that perspective of what are the tools, what are the techniques that we're illustrating? And we've got a lot of tools to talk about, but I'm going to lead us off with one that is very near and dear to my heart. Let's talk a little bit about the Open Learning Initiative. So how many of you have heard of OLI? Not all of those hands are up. This is uh, concerning. So. What we're gonna be illustrating are two different tools. Uh, first, the OLI platform, and then the new OLI authoring and iterative improvement uh, platform called Echo. We're gonna take a look at both of those. Um, let's start off by taking a really quick look at the OLI delivery platform. And the reason that I wanna do this is I wanna call out a few features for you that connect back to some of these techniques and that make it possible for us to engage in that larger learning engineering life cycle. Um, so let's take a quick trip and log into the OLI system. The course that I'd like to highlight is actually the statistics course that you just heard Richard mention. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about OLI is that it was built from the ground up with this intention of providing a place where we can take what we're learning from the learning sciences, use this to build the best course possible, but also recognize that there's an awful lot we don't know. And so we were intending to build a platform that was going to give us a chance to explore, to answer questions, to run fresh experiments. When we take a look at the statistics course, go. one of the pieces I'd like to call out is that OLI is intended to support some very intentional designs that are reinforced not just in the course materials but in the larger navigation. One of the constructs that we see in the OLI stats course is this notion of a big picture of the course. This is something that we end up using throughout the course, um, really trying to build upon these pieces of knowledge. And it's something that we see not just in this course content but also back up in the navigation. So that as our learners are engaging with these materials, they are constantly being given the chance to take the individual components that they're learning, these smaller skills, and connect them back to this larger model of learning, this larger domain that we're trying to teach them. What this also means is that we've attempted to build out an interface and a set of navigation that's going to keep similar things nearby. It's going to give our students a chance to get where they need to go without overloading them with information. As you start to drill into an OLI course, you'll start to see some of the things you'd expect, examples, expository content, um, and really this chance for students to see in context worked examples before we get to one of the pieces that I think has been just absolutely essential to OLI's success. And that's been the ability to actually embed short questions and assessments in the learning process so that the students aren't being taken out of their uh, immediate context. We give them this chance to ask a question. And it's important to note that in this case, we are not expecting our students to have figured this stuff out yet. So you'll note that we call this a learn by doing activity and this reflects some pedagogical decisions that were made. We're going to give students the chance to ask a question. We expect them to have some, uh, excuse me, we expect them to make some mistakes. And as they start to answer these questions, what they're going to be giving them is some immediate feedback. So when the student uh, knows what they're doing, we want to reinforce that and we want to explain why this answer was correct. But maybe more importantly, when they're making some decisions that aren't quite on point, we want to give them some targeted feedback that's going to help them to reorient. And hopefully they're able to take this targeted feedback, apply it, think through the problem, and then go back and take another, another shot at it. So what you're seeing in this case is that we know a little more about the decisions that students are making as they move through the course, right? We know that they're not simply making some clickstream points, but rather that they're actually 
giving answers that tie back to misconceptions, which in turn relate back to skills. At some point, once we've established this chance for them to make some mistakes and learn some things, we now want to get to a point of self-assessment, talk about these as, did I get this activities? And as the data starts to come back to us and we start to understand the path that students have taken through these course materials, we know a bit more about the underlying design. And that's going to allow us to do some really interesting things on the authoring and improvement side, but also back on the research side. Beyond the sort of core content, uh, we also built OLI to be a place where we could take advantage of other technological affordances, where we could embed other kinds of technologies, either because they were specific to the domain of study or because it gives us a chance to answer fresh research questions. So in this case, uh, culminating most of the modules in statistics, we have a more synthetic activity that leverages the Cognitive Tutor Authoring Toolkit, walks students through an EDA process. A few other quick points um, you know, beyond the sort of core content. We do offer what we talk about as my response activities in OLI. So we've got some opportunity to work with the students on metacognitive skills and communicate a little uh, information back to their faculty when this is being used in a face-to-face -face class. And lastly, if we're going to be working through these practice opportunities, we do eventually need to have a chance to assess them. And so we've got high stakes assessment embedded in the course as well. Behind all of this, we have data. So we're instrumenting our courseware. What does that get us? Well, it turns out it gets us an awful lot. You've already started to see some of the elements of the research cycle that this provides, but this also gives us the chance to engage in better estimates of student learning. Uh, what you're seeing here is the learning dashboard. It's a tool that is embedded in OLI and um, was built by a larger team here at CMU, but was really led by Marcia. So if you're interested in this, you should be talking to Marcia and asking her questions over lunch. Um, our notion here is that against the learning objectives in OLI, we are estimating student learning. And as an instructor, I'm able, after I assign this, to take a quick look, see across these learning objectives where students seem to be doing well from the course materials. Uh, those are the ones in the green. But also recognize the places in the, uh, in the red and yellow where students are still struggling. So in addition, we can see the students in the gray who uh, have not done quite enough to allow us to make a prediction. Judy, you need to get to work. <laughs> so this also gives us a chance to drill down, take a deeper dive, and understand what are the underlying skills that are giving students problems. From those underlying skills, what are the specific questions that are giving students issues? And maybe more importantly, to identify the specific misconceptions that they're exhibiting. So this ends up giving you a chance when you walk into the classroom to really think about where students are struggling and to have some information that can feed into that. And I just botched my movie. Last quick point. Um, I'd like to show you another course that we use here at Carnegie Mellon, a course called Computing at Carnegie Mellon. It's one of the only courses that um, every student at CMU takes. And this is really intended to give students a set of uh, sort of core tools and techniques they're going to need throughout the Carnegie Mellon experience. This includes a section on information literacy. So we're taking these same constructs of learn by doing, did I get this, self-assessment, applying them in a different context. And it turns out, since this was one of the first courses that I worked on, that I tend to uh, spend a lot of time still thinking about. And that takes us to the next thing that I'd like to show off, which is actually the authoring tool. So how many of you have tried working on an OLI course in the past? How many of you have found it a painful experience? It's a challenge, right? I mean, we spent a lot of time sort of digging into the XML. Um, and, and this, I think, highlights another issue that we'd like to be paying more attention to as we think about the toolkit. How do we take these tools and try to get them to a place where they are more usable by a larger population of educators? This has been an area that we've focused on. So um, this is at echo.oli.cmu.edu. The team has been hard at work on this. It's been a major investment for us over the past year. We're going to jump in and take a look at that computing at Carnegie Mellon course. So one of the other things that the data is going to give us is support for a team-based approach for editing. We're going to take a look at that information literacy section. 
And one of the first things that we want to highlight here is a notion of understanding what are the skills and learning objectives that we're attempting to teach, and just how well do we seem to be doing with that. Um, the first point on that, as we drill in, got to get a better guy to drive that mouse, is to be able to look across our skills and our learning objectives and understand what questions are addressing these skills, where are we giving students practice opportunities, where are we giving them high stakes opportunities, and from this, this is going to allow our learning engineers and our faculty to jump in and start directly addressing points in question. So we talk about this as a design audit process. I'll reference this in a little bit. Um, but this is one of the affordances that ECHO is going to give us. The data also allows us to make more thoughtful use of um, student performance information as we start to identify where exactly do we need to make our improvements. And so we're going to take a quick look at the module view of this same evaluating information section and take a look at some new analytics. This is a set of information that just came online over the last week and a half. And what you're going to do is drill into the learning objective and get a sense of student performance. What are the questions that students seem to be struggling on initially? Where are they getting to uh, success in the end? And where are they still struggling? And you can imagine that when we tie this information back to some of those semantic constructs, if I know, for example, that it's a learn by doing activity, that that initial struggle might be OK, so long as they're eventually getting to a correct answer. We have other areas where they seem to be struggling initially. They're not quite getting it. And this is a place where we need to drill in and take a deeper dive. But the other thing that the toolkit can do And I'm missing one of my videos. Um, so the last thing that the toolkit is going to give us the chance to do is actually add in new content, right? And as we're adding in new content, that need to go in and be able to connect our skills back to those learning objectives, a thing that we talk about as skills mapping, is something that we've made fairly easy inside of the toolkit. And so after this talk, at some point at lunch, stop by. Either I or uh, one of the OLI team can give you a demo of that information. So what we're talking about then are two different tools, one that's going to focus on the design and improvement cycle, one that focuses on uh, OLI as, a, as, as an actual delivery mechanism. The techniques that we've just illustrated, first were that of skills mapping, and second, this notion of a design audit. Skills mapping turns out to be fairly important. And at surface, it seems like it's pretty simple, right? Let's identify our skills, let's connect them to our learning activities, and let's see where it is that we're assessing those. Uh, I'm indebted to Dale Pike down at Virginia Tech, who after hearing about this, described it as learning design as hypothesis. That these sets of learning activities represent a very implicit hypothesis for how we believe students can meet these skills. The simple act of skills mapping can be pretty valuable. Simply by itself, it can sometimes reveal skills that you're missing. But it also gives you the chance to really ask yourself, if I have a hypothesis, is my hypothesis complete enough for testing? So is this hypothesis complete enough for testing? I've got a room full of educators and instructional designers. What are the problems with this map? David? Blue skill isn't being assessed. Right. Why are we teaching things and then not assessing it? Any other problems? Purple skill is not being assessed. Are we testing things that maybe we're not sure we're teaching? Kind of a problem, right? Now, again, this seems really simple, right? And obviously, this is something we should all be doing in our instructional design. But it turns out that absent tools to support this, making these kinds of connections is really challenging. But once you've made these connections, it allows for the application of much more robust and interesting tools and techniques. Similarly, you saw this design audit, where we wanted to take a close look at how much are we offering in practice, how much are we offering in high stakes assessments, and you know, are, are we offering sufficient opportunities in both? Making it easier for our educators to do this kind of audit, drill down and make sure that at least their course is reasonably well designed, then gives us the opportunity to ask some of the harder questions about alignment between the content components. It allows us to take the model that's represented here, send it off to something like DataShop, and drill in with some more uh, sophisticated techniques. 
So one of the tools that I illustrated here, a little less time than I'd expected, is a tool called Echo. Um, the Echo authoring environment is available for anyone to jump in and use right now at echo.oli.cmu.edu. Um, Echo allows you to make brand new courses. It allows you to clone and customize existing OLI courses. And uh, there's a lot of work that goes into that. What's also exciting, though, is that the skills map that is coming out of Echo can be used in the OLI platform can be used in a lot of our data analysis tools. That code base is already open. You can find it um, on the Simon GitHub site. And so with each of these, as we open up these tools, we want to put out a call to you as a community on things that we're hoping that you'll do with these tools. On the application side, go create some new material. If you're convinced that you have a better way to teach statistics than some component of the OLI course, we want to see it. Go take it and customize it because the data that comes back from the, those kinds of experiments will really help us to better understand what kind of content we should be using. For those of you that are excited to jump into the code base, we ask that uh, we've built out a framework for ingesting OER content. I feel like there's a lot of good stuff out there, and if we can pull it in, then we can focus our attention on building the rich activities that need to surround it. Um, we've got one or two examples of that in place. We would love to see more content that can be ingested. On the OLI side, I was demonstrating two different techniques. The first is instrumented content. So when we're able to deliver in an instrumented way, what we get is consistent data collection, capturing things down at a learner interaction level. And though every platform that's out there is now telling you that they capture clickstream data, um, we're getting something that is richer than clickstream and we think more useful. That's baked into OLI. In addition, as the OLI course is being developed, you're tying into an underlying library of constructs, ranging from dialogue to examples to walkthrough videos. And this tells us something about the pedagogical intent of the content that's been instrumented. Uh, I've heard a couple of people describe this as an information architecture for learning. And again, this is baked in when you're developing in the OLI space. But I want to note, this assumes some very deliberate design. It gets back to the comment that David uh, found on his blog that Sure, all this stuff makes sense, but it seems hard. In fact, it is hard. What we're trying to do is build tools and make them available that will take what's an incredibly difficult task and make it a little bit easier. So we noted uh, OLI is available for use right now. You jump in and use our existing courses. We intend to have the code available openly in October. We're trying to do a few last-minute updates on the Java side. And we'd like to do one more security pass before we uh, unveil and make available all of the student code to the students who might be using it. Um, there's also a nice open education event in October that uh, maybe might make a nice venue for the announcement. So what we've seen are a couple of different phases of this life cycle. I've talked about the design, develop, and deliver phases. We've shown you some techniques and some tools that bake those in. We've talked a little bit about when they're available. Um, what questions do you have? What comments do you have? All right. Brandon? Sorry, can you? Uh... How do you train people how to use this? Do you do a summer program or something? You're trying to set me up there. So in fact, we recognize that providing appropriate support for this kind of work is, is, is really important, right? It's not about simply throwing these tools out, but rather we're trying to build a community. We need to think about the support elements. Um, Aaron is going to actually be calling out some very specific training and capacity building activities, including a summer workshop that we're very proud of. But we're also hoping that our continuing work with EEP will give us the chance to identify maybe smaller chunks of uh, of, of workshop that might be useful, and then see those facilitated. Uh, we're setting a sidebar conversation. All content built on the OLI can be praised in the OLI. Is that correct? So the question was, uh, is the content that's being built in Echo only play on OLI? And the answer there is, yes, that's currently correct. Um, but there's an open code base sitting under that author. And so if someone is really interested in getting it to play in a different space, that's a possibility. But we've also focused hard on making OLI interoperable. And so plugging it into anything that supports LTI is also fairly straightforward. It currently supports LTI and Advantage? It supports some components of LTI Advantage, but we're still mostly at 1.1. We're not, uh, you know, that's another one that we're trying to get fully compliant. So. 
Yes, and can we can you wait for the mic for our viewers at home? Hey, so first I want to say thank you. Um, this is an initiative that just advances the conversation for all of us who are trying to advance the conversation for our students and faculty and communities. So it's just amazing, and we so appreciate that $100 million goes into this and not three new data centers. Um, and um, I just think it's awesome, you know. So um, a couple of things to, about the training to follow up. Will, will you think about methodology training, sort of like the discover, design, develop, deliver, or software like that. I think the methodology for all of us, I know we're excited to fetishize the platform, tools, 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 but I think the methodology, as we know, is really what advances great teaching, and then this undergirds that. So I would urge or even be willing for NYU's instructional designers to have a conversation with you about methodology. So we'd love to see how to support you, and thanks again for the great work. Excellent. Ken, do you want to? Uh, just to be more explicit about the, if you want to attend our summer school last week of July, the learn, go to learnlab.org, and you can apply to attend that week-long summer school. And the, the applications are due uh, May 10th. Uh, so that's <laughs> three days from now. Uh, and... and uh, there are four tracks uh, that inv there's online course development, intelligent tutoring development, educational data mining, and uh, collaborative, uh, computer supported collaborative learning. I just want to, so I have two questions. Can you Sorry. hear me? Uh, um, so do you, do you consider OLI the platform adaptive, and is there a student dashboard so they can see some of the things that the instructor sees? So I'll take the second one first. Um, there is a student-facing element to the dashboard, but we leave it to individual faculty members to decide whether they're going to expose that to their learners or not. Um, you know, we feel like there needs to be some confidence in the underlying uh, learner model and skills model. And you know, faculty need to feel comfortable in showing students whether they're succeeding or not through that environment. Um, we do consider it adaptive. And we consider it adaptive in a couple of ways. First, that we're trying to intentionally design things like, did I get this activities, to allow the student to adapt their own behavior, uh, providing targeted feedback that helps them in their own metacognitive development we think is much more important than quickly um, you know, adapting the content behind their back. It's adaptive in that the learning dashboard supports an awful lot of instructional adaptation. And we support adaptation and adaptivity down at the activity level. So when we embed something like a CTAT produced tutor, you're explicitly getting the kind of adaptive learning technologies that, that I think folks often traditionally mean when they ask about adaptivity. Marcia, you got a comment. Do you want to? Yeah, I want to pick up on um, our NYU colleagues' point that the, um, the, what we think is really exciting here is not just the tools, but the techniques underlying. And I think a lot of the folks in the room are instructional designers, learning engineers, or have teams that work in that space. Some of these tools are designed to make those folks' jobs easier. So in, some, in addition to a uh, you know, faculty member on the street. Um, but in particular, um, I think the input from that community to help build out these tools, make them better, tie in other uh, components of your processes is a real important opportunity for the community. So I just wanted to echo that. Any other questions? 